Hello and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. I just want to give you all a quick reminder again that Just and Center as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask that you consider becoming a regular contributor. You can go to justincenter.org and go to our donate page there and uh, help us out with all uh, the things that we do here. Um, So we are going to be jumping back into the series that we just started last week. Uh, And this is a series called Makers of the Modern World. Uh, If you haven't watched the or listened to the one from last week on Karl Marx, that's probably a good place to start. Though I assume that if you're watching this, you probably have watched that one first, because there's uh, far more of an interest, I think, in Marx than Lukács, who we're going to be talking about today, who's a relatively unknown figure for a lot of people, but an extremely significant one. So uh, as we've been going through, we've just started this series, um, we are going to be looking at figures who have shaped the the ideologies uh, that we face in our in our world today in the 21st century. So we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, figures that have shaped uh, modernity, postmodernity, and and onward. And we began with Marx, and since we began with Marx, we're going to be going through some of the major figures that are influenced by Marx, who shape the way that people think not only about economics, not even like mostly about economics, really, we're going to be looking at how people think about culture, and how they think about media, and ideology, and those kinds of issues uh, that we see around us. So... Uh, I was initially going to go right from Marx to uh, Theodore Adorno and the Frankfurt School, who created critical theory. Uh, Critical theory is probably familiar uh, to many of you through critical race theory, which is kind of connected, but it's a whole different beast. So um, this is, uh, I think, a necessary step, because when we jump from right from Marx then going into the Frankfurt School and critical theory, there's a lot of development that we're really missing. So there are a number of influential figures within Marxism uh, that lead to what we see with the Frankfurt School and critical theory, but there's really one figure who I think is probably more central than many others, and in him we see some of the moves that we also see in other figures, so it's not like it's just, it's just Lukács. Uh, so that is Georg Lukács. And Georg Lukács is, as I said, not a particularly well-known figure. And you may have clicked on this video or listened to this podcast uh, wondering what, in, who in the world this is and why I'm talking about him. Uh, but, but he is known as the father of Western Marxism. And Lukács really sets the, he's kind of the bridge between Marx and the Frankfurt School. And there are a number of influential ideas that we see in him that are going to lead to the development of Marxism and then later post-Marxism as we look at ideas in the West. All right, so Georg Lukács is how this name is is pronounced. Uh, And I know that you probably look at that and think it's George Lukács or something. Uh, (laughs) But uh, Georg Lukács is the proper pronunciation, at least as far as I can tell. And I've watched a, uh, and I initially studied Lukács reading a number of books. And when you read books, you always wonder how people are, people's names are pronounced. So uh, I clicked on a number of, uh, you know, YouTube videos that overview Lukács from people that that appreciate him. And that seems to be the pronunciation. So (laughs) hopefully it's correct. Uh, Okay. Uh, So we're going to, as we did last time with Marx, we start with biographical information. We're going to kind of talk about his historical context, who he is, uh, and then we will start looking at his ideas. Uh, There is going to be critique here, um, so we are going to get into some of the critiques of his ideas. Now, I will say that not a lot of Lukács, I mean, he wrote a lot, okay? He wrote a lot in very, very long books. A lot of it, most of it probably, has not been translated. And so he does not have... Though I think he has a major influence on the English-speaking world, he really has an influence on the English-speaking world, not so much through his own writings, but through the individuals that he influenced. And so this thing we're going to see about Lukács is the reason we don't know his name is because we don't really encounter Lukács through Lukács. Uh, We end up encountering some of his ideas through the Frankfurt School. Uh, We will, by the way, I know a number of you have asked if we're going to be looking at Antonio Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci is a significant figure. We will be looking at Gramsci as well. So if we're talking about the Marxists and then those who are influenced by Marx in various ways, uh, you know, right now I have planned after this, I have a a presentation on Adorno planned. Uh, Gramsci is coming. I'm I'm working through reading uh, currently a book on Gramsci. Uh, It's a 
book published by uh, Brutledge on Gramsci, and there's uh, some other things I've read on Gramsci as well, but I'm making my way through that before I do that, but we will be dealing with Gramsci also. Okay, so Lukács, his years are 1885 through 1971. Uh, he was born in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, he is the son of an investment banker, and this is something that we're going to see repeatedly. We've already seen this with Marx and discussed this a little bit, but the Marxist thinkers, and we'll revisit this again and again, but Marxist thinkers, the Marxist leaders are not from the proletariat. And I, I think that there is a lot of significance to that fact, that those who spend their lives dedicated to what is supposedly the cause of the proletariat are generally from wealth themselves. And I don't know what the reason for that is. I'm sure that there would there could be some kind of you know psychoanalysis of of the reasoning for uh, these people born in wealthy and upper middle class families. Whether it's this kind of burdening sense of guilt, looking at the maybe the the conditions of the poor and seeing how much better they had it. I don't know. Maybe some of the same things that kind of drive a lot of uh, kind of white guilt uh, t today uh, with some movements. I, I, I don't know, but I, I can't psychoanalyze him. But, but nonetheless, I think it's an important factor to think through when we look at these Marxist figures who are fighting for the proletariat, that they are not themselves part of the proletariat. They are very much from the upper class or upper middle classes. So he's a son of an investment banker who's rather wealthy. He also married into a wealthy family. So his wife was also from an upper class family. Lukács' father actually became a baron, and that meant that Lukács himself was a baron. Uh, so that he had, he, he was very clearly upper class. Uh, his family was Jewish, but converted to Lutheranism. And so we see this in a lot of these thinkers as well. It's interesting all the commonalities between these thinkers, because many of them tend to, tend to be ethnically Jewish, but though they are ethnically Jewish, many of them have converted to Protestantism. So that, that's just a commonality between him and, and Marx and some other uh, Marxist figures as well. Uh, no, I don't think this means there's some vast Jewish conspiracy you know, kind of thing that they're all involved in. I, I really don't. <laughs> so, so I know that uh, the conspiracy theorists love that. But uh, nonetheless, it's it's interesting to note the commonalities between these people. Okay, so he his his father though it seems like from the information that that I gathered, it seems like his father was not actually particularly religious. So uh, you know, I don't know if perhaps the these kind of conversions to Protestantism seems the same with Marx's father as well that these conversions to Protestantism really may be more about kind of social class or something like that than they really are necessarily about um, some kind of deep, deeply held religious belief or something. All right, so he completed his doctorate in philosophy uh, in 1909 at the University of, of Budapest. And we'll see that his ideology shifts uh, very much, or his area of focus shifts. He is initially interested in, in aesthetics. We'll see the same with the Frankfurt School. There is an interest in art and aesthetics, uh, but then he, it, throughout his career, gets more and more interested and then later involved in more political ideas. So he began to connect with other socialist intellectuals. He was in various intellectual socialist circles throughout Hungary, Germany, and Italy. So he's connecting with, with radical thinkers in various parts of Europe. He then began what was called the Sunday Circle in Berlin in 1915. And in the Sunday Circle, he gathered together a bunch of other intellectual thinkers. They would gather together and have just discussions. Uh, so largely these discussions surrounded the topic of aesthetics, because that was Lukács' primary interest at this time. Uh, they were largely idealists, these thinkers, meaning that they believed that ideas were the ultimate reality. We talked about Karl Marx as the opposite of that. He's a materialist, meaning that the physical stuff of this world is the ultimate reality. There is no kind of separate realm of the ideas or the forms as we find in somebody like Plato. So this group at this time is largely idealist. Now, as they began discussing some political issues, which was really inevitable at this time, because we're talking World War I, uh, at the end of World War I, they split over political differences. And so this Sunday circle, you see, was, was divided. And this, 
happens in a lot of intellectual circles in the post World War One, uh, leading into World War Two era, is there were very very strong divides throughout Europe among intellectuals uh, over what direction things should take because there was a general agreement that the world was kind of a mess post World War One, and they differed in terms of what the solution would be. All right, so then uh, Lukács becomes uh, very devoted to the communist cause. And at this point, uh, his career really shifts, though he is initially, as I said, interested mostly in aesthetics and philosophical discussions. Because of World War II, uh, Lukács then becomes committed to the cause of communism. So he joins the Communist Party of Hungary in 1918. It says 1818, but that's, <laughs> that's a typo there that I missed when I was looking through this. Uh, yeah, so 1919. Uh, he was then there was a there was a very brief communist state in the year 19. 19. So there was a success, semi-successful revolution for a very brief period of time. And in that brief period of time, uh, in 1919, he was appointed to several posts. And this is going to be important as we look later on. Uh, we can look at his ideology and ask about his ideology as we see what he did in those brief posts, specifically with regard to education and the silencing of opposing voices. So then he was actually imprisoned for, for a while after this uh, because uh, the, this revolution was failed. Uh, it didn't take very long for that to happen. He's briefly in prison. There's like there's a, a, a there's a petition that goes around. People are, are protesting that he needs to be released. So eventually he is he is released from prison. Um, then we see here his intellectual work has really moved from these theories of aesthetics, um, and he writes a lot on the novel. So his, his writing on the novel has actually been quite influential in some circles. And then he really delves into philosophical Marxism. So what we see here, and this is going to be key, is a thinker who is largely a philosophical and aesthetic thinker, one who is concerned with cultural production, really, not economics, so we're talking about novels and art, who is committed to Marxism. And what we see is that now there is a, a bringing together of a variety of disciplines under the broader banner of Marxism. So George Lukács is often referred to as the father of Western Marxism. So and this is why he's the father of Western Marxism is because now he is really spreading um, his ideas through the means of really media, art, art forms. He is viewed by some at this time as a deviator from classical Marxism. Some actually accuse him of being far too far right, which is bizarre, but others accuse him of being too far left. He's a, considered a, quite an original thinker among the Marxists. And this is something that you see among the Marxists is they tend to eat their own. Because if you read through the uh, the things that happen with a lot of early Marxists, in if you're looking at the Bolshevik Revolution or or you know other Marxist movements, they're constantly like excommunicating each other. <laughs> they're constantly saying that this person's not a genuine Marxist, and, and there's so much infighting in these groups. So we see just a little bit of evidence for that. Uh, and he was accused of being far too right and far too left in writing, both within was within a period of like six months or something. So it was uh, within a very short period of time. So uh, Lukács incorporated sociology, and this is key. He incorporated sociology into Marxism. And so he is the first kind of real interdisciplinary Marxist. And this is what we see developing with Marxists and then later post-Marxists as well. So he um, goes back into the writings of Hegel. And if you remember from our talk on Marx, uh, Hegel was the most significant philosopher on Marx's own thought. <clears throat> we will be doing a separate video on Hegel. Hegel's philosophy is quite complicated, but... We talked about how Hegel sees history as as progress, the growth of Geist or world spirit, as Hegel talked about. Um, but Marx is a, has a materialist interpretation of Hegel, meaning that history is progressing. But when he's talking about history, he's really talking just about the physical stuff of this world. He's not talking about any underlying uh, spirit 
or, or non-physical thing or just in terms of the realm of ideas as Hegel tends to focus on, but he's talking about things like material production. And so uh, Marx kind of viewed the growth of this world and world history as something really mechanistic. It's, it's as if communism was the inevitable result just of physical processes, just like would be the case throughout the development of the species throughout the, you know, the, the story of evolution or something like that. So uh, Lukács, though, delves more into Hegel and starts to take Hegel a lot more seriously than just grabbing onto this notion of progress. And what he recognizes is that the early Marx was a lot more Hegelian. Okay, so he was a lot more influenced by Hegel. And this is something you're going to see with this generation of Marxists and then uh, with Western Marxism generally is they're going to focus primarily on the early Marx rather than the later Marx. So the much more philosophical Marx. And there are still debates today about early Marx, later Marx, how consistent early Marx was with later Marx. But we don't have to get into to those debates. The important thing is just that he is devoted to, Lukács, that is, is devoted to the early Marx. So he starts incorporating Max Weber's sociology uh, and Hegel's ideas into Marxism. So Marxism becomes a much more all-encompassing movement. So we're not just talking about things like exploitation. Uh, we're not just speaking about economic realities. Now we're bringing broader uh, philosophical and sociological ideas into the discussion. All right. So historical materialism. Now, what is historical materialism? Well, that's what we were just talking about with, with regard to Karl Marx. So historical materialism is different from historical idealism uh, or the German idealism of Hegel, meaning that there is this progress in history. Uh, and for Hegel, that is a progress largely of ideas. And ideas develop throughout time. Uh, and the what he calls the Geist or this world spirit grows uh, as culture changes and grows as ideas develop. So there's this constant process that is leading towards some kind of telos or some kind of end. And as we talked about, Marx grabs onto that idea, but believes that it is not about ideas that are growing, but about material conditions. So when we get to Lukács, and we see this with a lot of these other uh, thinkers at this time as well in the Frankfurt School too, is that he rejects a deterministic view of historical materialism. So he doesn't believe that historical materialism is, there. there is this kind of mechanistic, automatic movement toward communism. And this is what we see in Marx and a lot of earlier Marxists, is they believe that just, just as, you know, science determines that the human person is going to grow up, uh, which means that certain things are going to happen, right? They're, the human person is going to um, get taller, for example. Their their intellect is going to develop more as they get older, and we can kind of guess when you have a child what's going to happen to them. <laughs> they kind of go through all go through the same process, right? They lose their teeth, they learn to walk, they learn to talk, all these kind of things. It's just it's just automatic. That's the way nature works. Um, Marx believed that society was basically going to do that as well. That society, just as human beings start to grow uh, and change, just inevitably, that that's what society does too. So he calls this a a scientific uh, form of of historicism or or materialism. So that. This is just, there's going to be the inevitable communist revolution. That's just what happens when society grows, just like people get taller when they grow. Or as they get old, their, you know, hair goes gray or falls out or whatever. Uh, so that is then rejected at this point. And that tends to be, at this point, it's really rejected by nearly all Marxists. Uh, because it became very evident pretty early on that the proletariat was not seeing the problem of their condition in the way that Marx thought they would. So there weren't these just inevitable, you know, communist or socialist revolutions that were occurring. Now we do have the Bolshevik revolution, but that took a lot of uh, kind of force <laughs> uh, for that to happen. And you see some Marxists actually rejecting the Bolshevik revolution for various reasons, but one of them is because of the nature of the force that was used, because there wasn't an allowing the inevitability of this to just kind of take, take shape. So uh, Lukács is also going to discuss the importance of human subjectivity. So while Marx is speaking more in terms of just material economic conditions, Lukács is going to say we can't ignore the actual internal feelings of the human 
subject. And this really is largely from Hegel as, as well. If you know anything about Hegel's approach to subject, object, and if you don't, don't worry about it. We'll get into it in, a, in our discussion about Hegel coming later. But he's going to emphasize the importance of the human person and the human feeling, the human uh, beliefs about various things, so subjectivity. So he's saying we can't just look at historical progress in terms of it being like a machine that just runs and does what it does. Uh, he says that materialism is not about the contemplation of an objective reality, but action. And we see this in Lukács. She increasingly moves away from contemplation or philosophical discussion to action. And so he's saying we can't just sit back, and he's accusing some of the other Marxists of doing this, and think about the objective reality of the world around us, but we have to just do. We have to take action. And this is something we see in Lukács, is that it's very clear that there is, especially when we get to, to moral and ethical questions that he writes on, there really is no objective reality outside of the action. That Lukács emphasizes acting. We have to make the socialist revolution happen. We have to take power. And we can't just think about what is objectively real or what's objectively going to happen. You kind of put those questions to the side in order to act in revolutionary ways. Uh, so he, he says that the theorist, in thinking, they're not a some kind of transcendental eye. Uh, and this would be Kant's perspective that he's rejecting here. So the, the theorist in thinking is not is not able to kind of raise themselves up above the historical circumstance and view what's going on in history and evaluate it objectively. So you, you can't just kind of sit back and say, well, I'm going to objectively watch what's happening and I'm going to look at economic conditions and the various other things that are happening in the world and then kind of make an unbiased decision about it uh, or write some kind of you know, doctoral thesis about it. No, he says that the theorist in thinking in the very issues is necessarily involved in the fight. And he's, he's very clear that everything is really a fight. It's it's battle. Uh, it is, it, you see his kind of seething hatred toward capitalism more, much more than you do in Marx, you see in, in Lukács. So everyone's involved in the fight. There's no way to escape this fight and you have to recognize that, and you can't just sit back and think. Even in thinking, you are involved in that historical process. So he says that the proletarian standpoint is paramount. So if you remember the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the difference between them being the, the bourgeoisie is that class which controls the means of production. So these are the, the upper classes. Uh, and the proletariat are those who are the ones who actually produce things. And in Marx's view, you have the exploitation of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie. Uh, so the bourgeoisie controls the means of production. The proletariat's actually producing things. And then there is this kind of surplus value that comes across, that comes out of what the proletariat is paid, essentially on top of it. And the bourgeoisie just takes, right? So they exploit the work so that they can take this, this excess funds and pay themselves, and pay themselves much better than those who are actually working and creating things. Uh, and this is through industrialization and the growth of, of factory work uh, where we see this uh, happen. So he says that the proletarian standpoint is really where everything everything comes from, right? We, we need to understand, in a way we can only understand, reality through the lens of the proletariat. So if you're part of the bourgeoisie, you can't even really understand truth. And here is where uh, we talked about last time about what Ludwig von Mises calls uh, polylogism, which is that there is kind of a different standard of truth among the various classes so that we can't even have a kind of discussion about what is true or what is not, because it's really more about, about viewpoints. And the proletariat views truth in a way that the bourgeoisie isn't even capable of because they see it from, from their eyes, and their eyes are the only ones that can really grasp what's really happening. Um, so the, the polylogism, I think, shows up here in Lukács much more than it does in Marx as well. Uh, but I think we see the, the, at least the seeds of this kind of idea in Marx. Um, but I do think that we see, we see traces of this today. I think we see traces of this today when um, you look at some of the progressive dialogue that says things like, that logical thinking is is just part of Western culture, 
and therefore we can't think in terms of logic. We have to just think in terms of oppression and dividing class groups. Now, I think that's that's very much insulting uh, toward ethnicities that are not white who can very much think think logically. But the idea behind that is that there is no objective truth or reality that we can all come to and say what's right, what's wrong, but that you have to be in that kind of oppressed group or minority group status in order to really, really understand what the truth is. So truth then in this view is, is very much limited to the proletariat. So it's only the proletariat that can grasp the totality, as he says. Now, if we think about that term totality, this is, this is something that comes from Hegel. So for Hegel, all reality is essentially one, right? This is the notion of, of this geist or this world spirit that exists underneath all things, that we all share in this one world spirit. It's, it's monistic is the term that philosophers often use just to mean everything is, is one. So at least if we're talking about the realm of spirit or the realm of ideas, it, everything happens like together as, as part of a unit. So say it's not that you know, my life may progress in one way and your life may progress in another way and your ideas may change and my ideas or whatever may change. And it's not that we, if we want to really understand reality, it's not like I have one reality and you have one reality as an individual soul that you're involved in, but there's one broader reality that we're all involved in. We're all connected. And this this has some connections, some similarities to what we would say in, in Christianity that uh, we're all part of, you know, God's plan in this world and that that redemption is cosmic. So is the story of sin and the story of redemption are, are cosmic. They're, they're big picture stories. So uh, we could say in a sense that, yeah, there, there's truth to that. Um, but for, for Hegel, it's you have to understand everything in terms of this totality. And so, so for Lukács, the totality the real picture of things can only be understood by the proletariat. So only the proletariat really grasps what's going on underneath. They, they see the full picture. And the bourgeoisie is incapable of seeing it. Again, he's not part of the proletariat, so the whole thing is so bizarre. But, okay. Um, so only the proletariat can understand and change society. So change must come from the proletariat. They're the only ones that get it at all. And... They have this kind of, as we use the phrase uh, when we looked at Marx, of a, a kind of messianic status. And a, a lot of authors have argued, you know, non-Christian authors as well, have argued that this is, that what Marx has is a kind of secularized uh, eschatology, right? A, a messianic, uh, messianic view of history that gets rid of the Messiah as a person. And so it now is a class that is the one that's going to redeem all people. And that is the, the proletariat by destroying the bourgeoisie, essentially. All right, so he says, theory should lead to the development of class consciousness and political involvement. So uh, the goal of theory, we're talking about their philosophy, and they often use the term theory. Uh, and oftentimes theory is just used as a shorthand for Marxist thinkers, so critical theory. We just talk, sometimes they just talk about theory. So theory, the idea should lead to two things. So the first is class consciousness, which means that the, the proletariat needs to understand that it's oppressed and needs to understand the problem because oftentimes they don't get that they're oppressed. And so it is the role of who? The intellectuals, really the bourgeoisie intellectuals, the, the, the intelligentsia, you see the parallels in our culture today, I think, pretty obviously. I don't even have to spell them out. But the, the intellectuals need to educate the lower classes to let them know that they are oppressed and essentially get them to revolt. It's, it's the role of the intellectuals, because they really know what's going on, to get the proletariat to revolt. And so theory leads to revolution political involvement. So theory is not just about ideas, but ultimately it always has this practical end, which is revolution. Uh, the final point I have in terms of historical materialism here is that theory must be total. So theory deals with the totality of all reality. This is something you see in Hegel. Hegel as a philosopher really wants to 
give an explanation for everything, which is kind of a hard task. <laughs> and most people don't think Hegel succeeded in doing that, but Hegel certainly thought Hegel succeeded in doing that. Uh, that his philosophy answered all, basically all the questions that you would ever need to answer in, in philosophy. He had this, this kind of totalizing notion of, of his own thought. So theory must be total. It must explain everything. So when we're talking about this battle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, we're saying this theory, this explains everything. Like if theory is done right, it explains the nature of all reality. So we're not talking just about the narrow field of economics that is one thing among many. We're saying that no, true Marxism, in Lukács' perspective, explains ethics, it explains truth, it explains human purpose and identity and reality, all of those things. It is total in its explanatory value. All right, so this is now a really important part of Lukács, and this is probably the, the area of Lukács' thought that is most well-known. So even if you've never heard of Lukács in your life, if you've done any reading on uh, Marxist, post-Marxist ideology, you will have heard this term, reification. And this is largely drawn from Marx, but Lukács adds a little bit more of his own ideas to this. So this is taken over by most Marxist uh, post-Lukács, even those who would disagree with him on, on many other points. Uh, and if you, so if, if you remember, uh, Marx discussed this idea of commodity fetishism. And where Marx says that value is essentially placed in capitalism upon the commodity itself. Okay, so what is what are we talking about with the commodity? Well, it's it's whatever thing it is that you produce. So you you produce something in a factory, and then that thing is is sold or traded for something else. In that context, you are basically treating that whatever thing you have that's sold as if it has value in itself. And for Marx, the value really should be the amount of labor that's put in because the person who's doing the labor is the valuable thing. That's what's valuable, not just the object itself. He takes that from Adam Smith, um, and there are crit critiques of that, but I'm not going to get uh, too far aside there. But so he sees that we, we kind of fetishize, is the language he uses. There's no sexual connotations, as you may think, with that term. term. But we treat the commodity or the things that are produced as if they they are like persons, right? as if they have some kind of independent force, as if they are things of great value. For Marx, this is totally mistaken because it's really relations between persons that matter and the things just mediate relations between persons, right? So relations are mediated by by things. So uh, in Marx's view, say if you, if you produce you know, say a shoe and you sell it to somebody, uh, what's real is the relation person to person. And if the person pays you for making the shoe, what they should be paying for is your work that you put in. Uh, but instead of that, you're kind of objectifying this object, this shoe and saying that it in and of itself has this, you know, immense, immense value. And so you're treating it as if the object or the commodity has ultimate value. Uh, and the market itself then is seen as this kind of objective force. We view it as if it's just this kind of mechanical process, this force that controls us, and we have no say over what the market does. It's this just totally free, separate thing from us, and we're kind of beholden to the market. So that was all tied together with Marx's view of commodity fetishism. But what Lukács does it is that now he brings together the question of how commodity fetishism with how man is treated and he essentially says that there is that the that the object or the commodity is essentially treated as a person the commodity is treated as if it has value by itself he says now man is treated as basically an object so we trade our own personal authenticity we give it to the object and we are made like the object becomes the subject and I as the subject become an object. This is Hegelian language. They're constantly talking about subject object. This is just German idealism in general. Uh, but we basically trade our personhood with the commodity itself. And 
this means that when, say, you have you know factory workers or those who are, who are working you know in some kind of production, people are treated and then see themselves as merely part of a machine. So just as the machines, you know, say put together the shoe, and you maybe, you know, have a role in that in controlling the machine that's that's putting together the shoe in one way or another, uh, that means that you now are just just like another machine. You're basically just part of the machine. And it takes away authenticity and freedom from the self because you don't really have freedom. Your, your mindset is not one of, you know, I, I can freely choose what I want to do. You're just like a cog in the machine. So you are essentially dehumanized. So you are treated not as a human being, but an object. And then you learn to see yourself not as a human being, but merely an object in, in the machine. So that's that's the essence of, of reification. So we have this trading of subject object where the objects that we are creating are viewed as sub personal subjects. They're treated as persons with value. And we then are treat ourselves, uh, essentially. And it really, he would say the bourgeoisie is the one who creates this system. But, but we are treated as if we are mere objects. And we start to see ourselves that way. And we can't live authentically in freedom. Uh, and it's also important to say that in the tradition of, of German idealism in the Enlightenment, I mean, we can go back to, to Kant. Freedom is at the essence of what a human person is. And we see this in the development of liberal ideology as well. So a lack of freedom means a lack of humanity in this perspective, coming from a more German idealist approach. So you can kind of see how the, the dots are connected there. Okay, what we see in Lukács uh, is, you know, he, he starts to move Marxism forward in the West. He becomes this insanely significant figure, even though he's one that you probably don't know about. What we have is a clear resentment of the past and of inherited culture. This appears very obviously in Lukács. So we see this resentment. Um, you know, this is what, uh, say, Harold Bloom at at Yale, who died, you know, a few years ago. If you know him, he's a literary critic. He's very obnoxious, but uh, <laughs> but what he referred to in, in literature as the school of resentment, that so much of, of especially more progressive views of literature just kind of resent the past uh, and are just critiquing the past and use literature as a means to critique Western culture and you know to critique whiteness or you know patriarchy, male domination, imperialism, whatever you know, sin you want to pick uh, in, in that field. So we have the, really the beginnings of that in Lukács in a way that we don't actually have as much in Marx. And it's not to say that Marx doesn't have resentment, but Marx sees, remember, because Marx sees everything as this kind of inevitable progress materialistically, that he would see capitalism as a necessary just part of that story. Now, at times, he's extremely critical of capitalism, and especially in his personal writings, he is much more uh, kind of vindictive about capitalism than he is in his writings. But but he sees capitalism as, okay, it's a necessary step in the process, but we, but, but we got to move on to something else that's much better because of exploitation and, and the other problems in capitalism. Uh, but with Lukács, we start to see this extreme resentment of the past. We need to destroy the past. Uh, and inherited culture is just a means of oppression. Inherited culture uh, is there to uh, oppress uh, the proletariat. So the language of oppression starts to show up a lot here. Uh, the language of oppression isn't explicit in Marx. Now, I think certainly we could take uh, the language of exploitation in Marx and say that really is a kind of oppression. I, mean, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, but I know that people will often point out that Marx did not explicitly talk say about oppression. So Lukács is really the one who starts who starts speaking more in, in terms of oppression. So a resentment of the past, Western culture is bad. It's been used to uh, oppress these groups, whoever he decides are the proletariat, and we have to discuss who the proletariat actually is in this perspective. And then we have this notion that revolution must be total, so complete. So revolution means a complete and total overthrow of everything that's been inherited in the West. It's really a starting over. Complete revolution. So we see the, the, this radicalism in Lukács that we don't even have in Marx and the earlier Marxists. He's saying we get rid of everything. And it's because of his totalizing perspective taken from Hegel, 
right? Remember that the world spirit, this is totalizing, the Geist is totalizing, it encompasses all things. And he's going to say that uh, any theory, any theory that we have that is valid is going to see the total of things. And that means that revolution must change the total of all things. Revolution must change everything. So we're not talking about slow progress in this way or another way. We're saying, no, we overthrow and start over. Radical revolution. And it doesn't matter who we kill to get there. As he's very clear about this as well. But Okay. Um, centered the struggle between revolution and the capitalist system within culture. Okay, so here is, is really the key in Lukács that's going to be so influential upon just progressive ideology as a whole, post-Lukács, that we're seeing today as well, is that really the, the place where we have a fight, where we battle, is not just in the realm of economics, but it's culture. Culture is a battlefield. This is why people constantly talk about a culture war. And... On the right and the left, everybody's involved in a culture war, and it's true. There, there is, and I know we want to. <laughs> oftentimes, we we want to say, especially through the church, like we're we we do not want to be culture warriors. And I get what we're saying because well, we need to be focused on on the law and the gospel. Uh, it's not. Uh, it shouldn't be the role of the church in preaching to just preach about the culture. Certainly, but to some degree, we have been forced to be part of a culture war because Lukács started a culture war, and we're we're all there. Whether we want to deal with it or not, it's the reality that, you know, when I turn on uh, TV programming for my kids, there are ideas that are being forced, political ideas, uh, that are being forced down the throats of my kids. Now, I just say, don't, I don't let them watch stuff like that, but I'm just, it's very clear that the war is happening. So this Lukács says we got to focus on culture and media. We also see some Gramsci. Gramsci is the other major figure who does this as well. So Lukács and Gramsci are kind of the two major figures that start to move the battle from economics or politics into culture and then mass media as well. Okay, so he he is known as the creator of Marxist humanism. Uh, he is a humanist, meaning that he likes the humanities. And we see this in his own writing, in his own journey ideologically, and, and in terms of his, you know, his interest intellectually, is that he moves from literary critique, aesthetics, uh, and the fields dealing with the arts now, arts now to Marxism. So he's going to blend those two to say that Marxists should also be humanists. We we should spread our our ideology through books, through literature, through art, and uh, through various other. Uh, forms of the humanities. So, uh, also involved in all of this, Lukács believed in silencing those who disagreed with communism. So the ideology must be forced. It, it should be pushed through literature, through aesthetics, through the humanities in general, and those who disagree should be silenced. Now, we see this because he did this, okay? I'm not just, I'm not just like saying that I'm interpreting something. No, he, he did this. So in, in the brief periods when he was part of the communist regime in, in 1919 in, in um, Hungary, he was a, one of the title, he was appointed a couple different positions, but one of those, and the most significant of those was the Commissar for Education. And as a Commissar for Education, he fired all non-Marxist professors at the universities. So he believed that to control the society as a communist society meant to silence the opposition, especially in the colleges. So to, to bring professors that agreed with Marxism and Marxism would be pushed at the university. It was intellectuals that pushed Marxism toward the populace. And then it was pushed through media as well. So he did this. Like, we're not just saying this is theory. He wrote about this and I'm interpreting something this way. No, he did this. He said, we need to silence everyone who disagrees with communism in our universities. And he did it. He fired them. Um, some, and some great intellectuals lost their, their jobs uh, because of that. So then uh, he also, to make this more clear, he supported the banning of books in post-World War II Hungary. He fought for the banning of books. And I know that the left is constantly saying that you know, the right wants to ban books all the time, um, you know, because the right doesn't want 
sexually explicit material being taught to their kids in elementary school. Uh, but the left has, has, has often banned books. This is largely how I ideas are spread is we put forward our ideas and we try to silence those that don't agree with us. So that, that's just the reality of what happens in this world. And the left does it all the time. The left did it then, the left does it uh, today. So that's why if you go to a, often go to a bookstore, the books that are on display, say for kids, are all about, you know, pick your pronoun or whatever. I see this constantly when I'm taking my kids to bookstores. And, and you know, maybe they don't totally have no books that have any other ideology, but they're kind of hidden in the corner, right? So it's not totally banned, but it's certainly uh, you are trying to influence people by the ideas that that you have but there are other cases of books actually being being banned uh you certainly you have uh you know ryan anderson's when harry became sally being banned from amazon because of its approach to to um, gender issues a very very good book by the way and a very fair and balanced book it's not full of you know angry rhetoric or attacks or anything at all uh, but certainly you see books being banned on the left and you see that here with uh with lukacs Okay, here is, now this is a quote uh, from Roger Scruton's book, uh, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands, the Thinkers of the New Left. If you want a good treatment of a lot of these post-Marxist, I mean post-Marx figures, and not all post-Marxist, but uh, Western Marxist, later Marxist figures, uh, f uh, Roger Scruton's book is very fair, and, and I think very good. It's a very good critique. And he has some good quotes here uh, from Lukács. And here's one he says about capitalism. He's talking specifically about his earlier writings because Lukács does, as people tend to do, calm down a bit in his later life. Okay, he's, he's a revolutionary, very active, wants to destroy everything in his young years and becomes far more nuanced as he gets older. He says, at the time, the beginnings of the revolution, we all felt a bitter hatred for capitalism in all its forms. We wanted to destroy it at all costs and as quickly as possible. So you see this, this rabid, revolutionary fervor, anger, destroy it, destroy the past. All right, then we have, uh, this is important, uh, as we're talking about morality and how Lukács views. So for Lukács, the moral norms of the West had been formed by the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie forms how people view morality and think about what's right and wrong. And that's key to understanding morality is we have to, to see that our views of moral norms are not based on just some kind of, you know, objective evaluation of what's right and wrong, but the bourgeoisie tries to force upon us these things are moral, and they're really doing that in order to suppress. They're doing it in order to suppress the working class. And for Lukács, there really isn't an objective moral norm at all. There's no objective moral norm. We're not, not talking about you know, a natural law theory. And we've, we've lost natural law a while ago at this point. And I want to talk about the loss of natural law, because especially with Marx, we see a total rejection of natural law theory, which governed the West for a very long time, which says that there is an actual objective moral law that can be discovered by human beings that then human governments uh, can enforce in various ways. Uh, so there is no real objectivity. Again, we see that the bourgeoisie doesn't really have access to truth. Only the proletariat has real access to truth because they th see things as they really are. The bourgeoisie is blinded by that. They can't. Ultimately, for Lukács, the ultimate aim for the ethical life is one thing, the overthrow of capitalism. The overthrow of capitalism is, is the good to be fought for no matter the cost and no matter what you have to do, especially early Lukács. Even if it means that we have to act in an evil way. So things that we may ordinarily consider evil are good if we are doing it for the cause. And uh, here's another quote that Scruton has here in his book. Communist ethics makes it the highest duty to accept the necessity to act wickedly. And we see this in communist states, uh, the, the amount of absolute horrors, horrors in communist states that are committed in the name of communism. Because anything is allowed so long as 
it serves the interest of destroying capitalism and the bourgeoisie. So any kind of horrific torture, you know, anything is really morally permissible as long as it supports the cause. Uh, at some points in his writing, uh, Lukács even questions the humanity of the bourgeoisie. It's, at some points, it's very clear that he doesn't even see them as human beings because they don't really have true human existence. It's only the proletariat who really understands what being a human being really is. And you see that when there's a dehumanization of a certain part of the population, it's very easy to then justify any kind of violent or horrible act toward them that you want. All right. Uh, here is a quote from, there's Roger Scruton. If you don't know Scruton, you should. Uh, he's a brilliant writer. Uh, died just recently, but huge influence on, on me and how I view uh, culture. He has this, this quote. I know it's a bit lengthy here, but he's talking about Lukács' main achievement. So what's the, what's the main kind of takeaway from what Lukács did? If we're going to summarize his writings... What are we going to summarize it as? If we're going to summarize what, what he added to Western Marxism. He says, this then is Lukács' main achievement, to have revealed and endorsed the theological significance of Marxian economics and to have thereby adapted Marxist theories to the post-war world. So that's interesting. Uh, he, he's saying he, he gives a theological significance to what Marx is saying. So, let's, so what does he mean by that? Then we have this, this explanation. Uh, and we'll see this a little more as we get into Hegel, but... The Hegelian theory of alienation is not merely an account of man's path to self-awareness. It is a substitute for theology. It offers a secular theory of original sin. The evil that is abroad in the world is a sign and byproduct of man's self-estrangement. Man is an object who should be a subject, and his consciousness is through and through permitted by the triumph of things. Uh, so that's... That's this whole commodity fetishism idea. All power seems to him to reside outside himself, and nowhere does he encounter the spontaneity, the inner validity of a free human will, to show that capitalism is the necessary and sufficient condition for the state of self-alienation is to justify the holy work of revolution, in, even, and indeed especially in an age that has seen the material comforts that the market can bring. Uh, and so in Hegel's... Uh, notion of, of alienation. The it, this this has to do with kind of the division between, as I said, subjects and and objects. Uh, and Hegel is really giving a response to Kant and his noumenal phenomenal divide and how to handle that. There are a number of uh, other ways to to deal with that question. You find in like Schelling and others. Um, but the point is, we can. It just gets very, very complex. So let me kind of maybe boil down the essence of this as simply, <laughs> as simply as I can. Uh, man is essentially alienated from himself, and this alienation from the self has to be overcome. And in a Marxist system, this alienation occurs through man seeing himself as really an object. This is Lukács' reification, essentially. So a man sees himself as really an object and then attributes some kind of, kind of personal validity to objects and makes them subjects. And ultimately, this is a kind of projection, that we project our own freedom, our own will, these things onto objects. But we really need to understand that they don't belong to objects, they belong to us. We are the truly free agents. And so this, he says this is a, you know, a secular view of original sin. And we see that because we all have to explain, and here's ultimately the problem with, with Marxist systems, is they do come from an atheistic perspective, and they are trying to explain the realities of sin in the world. And they're not wrong to recognize exploitation, and I wouldn't agree with how they explain exploitation, but, but there, there is some form of exploitation, there is some form of oppression, these kinds of things really do happen. But when you take away sin as that which is in the heart from conception, you start to then project sin onto other things. So original sin is, here's the bad class, right? So the, the bourgeoisie is, the, that's the bad class. And once you get rid of that, you've gotten rid of the problem. This is the ultimate problem. We're not looking inward. We're looking outward to something else to be the problem. People do this constantly. This is just this is the human heart is we don't want to look in because that's too hard 
to recognize the reality of our sin and repent, uh, which is what we're called to do. But instead, we look outward and blame something else. Uh, so if we get rid of capitalism, then we get rid of our problem of self-alienation. So our alienation from ourselves, overthrow capitalism at all costs, that essentially brings about redemption. And this is why the system doesn't work, because capitalism is not our problem. Sin is our problem. And that doesn't mean we can't, you know, debate uh, the benefits of, of capitalism or the problems of capitalism and talk about what, you know, economic theory we want to, you know, adhere to or bring about in society. You know, that, that's, that's another question. But when we're talking about Lukács, uh, we're seeing that he essentially replaces sin with an oppressive class. He replaces truth with that which belongs to the oppressed class. And he replaces redemption with the oppressed class must overthrow. And then the kind of clergy of this new secular religion are the Marxist intellectuals. So here's the perennial problem. While Lukács views only the proletarian class as capable of understanding truth, he does not cite working class authors. Like at all. I mean, you ever tried to read Hegel? If you haven't tried to read Hegel, just look up, read some Hegel. Uh, look up a translation uh, of Hegel at some point. And just read like a sentence. <laughs> so, what is he talking about? I don't really. He's, he's extremely, extremely obtuse. He's very difficult to read. Uh, famously difficult to read. I mean, his sentences are, you know, over a hundred words long half the time. And his, his whole train of thought is, is so odd. <laughs> <laughs> just he's hard to follow and and he constantly references other philosophical works without really referencing them like he expects you to know you know literature art uh, history uh, other philosophy so that if he just makes his passing reference to this or that you're supposed to kind of get it which is extremely difficult uh don't read the phenomenology phenomenology of spirit without a guide to it um i i had to read some other books <laughs> that were helpful guides to what hegel is getting at because it, it is not easy to read so Lukács, he's not citing these proletarian working class authors, and he's saying they're the only ones that really grasp the truth in totality, but what he does is cite a bunch of intellectuals that would be completely, uh, you know, not even understandable in the slightest to the average working class person. So it seems very much like a contradiction. So we see Marx, Engels, Lukács, and this is the case with many other Marxists, but these are just the ones that I mentioned here. They're all upper middle class to upper class men. Okay, we said Marx himself was was uh, upper middle class, and his wife was was upper class. So not none of the Marxist thinkers, like none of these major thinkers, are from the proletariat, which otherwise would be okay, fine. But if you're saying that truth is only understood by this working class, and you're telling them what the truth is, and you're not from that class, it doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> like it just doesn't fit. It. it, it the, this doesn't really, it's not coherent. Okay, then um, he actually deals with the que this question at one point. And so he talks about the, the fact that a lot of the proletariat are not um, in agreement with Marxism, right? Like they're, they're not in agreement with Marxism, that most of the proletariat are like totally uh, dis disagree. And, you know, I mean, if you look at like, look at the United States today, um, you know, we still have, there is still, you know, a communist party in the United States, not that it's particularly big, but it exists. And if you look at the proletariat in the United States, well, who are those uh, who are like the, you know, factory workers? Well, they're the people in the Rust Belt and uh, in, and I've lived in the Rust Belt, you know, many times <laughs> in, in different parts of the Rust Belt. And those are like the you know, those are the big Trump supporters these days. So if you ask the supposed, you know, proletariat, if you're going to go kind of classical Marxism, like none of them, would, they'd be the most anti-Marxist people that there are. So like, how does this work if they're the ones that can see the truth? It's kind of odd. Well, when people start to question this, Lukács says that this is opportunism. Opportunism is when you confuse the views of actual working class people with what he calls the class consciousness of the proletariat. 
So there is a difference between what the proletariat actually believes, if you actually ask them one-on-one, if you do a survey of these people, that's different from the underlying class consciousness that, that exists there. So if the class consciousness doesn't actually show up in the views of the people that are part of that class, who are supposedly the only ones that can really grasp truth and reality or anything, who determines what class consciousness is? Because it it doesn't fit. Well, who determines what's good for the proletariat or what class consciousness is? The communist elites. Lukács. (laughs) This is what you find. with, and, And this is true, that in communist societies, those who have the most power are intellectuals. So Marxist intellectuals take the place of kings and clergy. They become the religious leaders. They are the ones who determine what's right and wrong. They're the ones who determine what's really good for you and what you really want. So, you know, maybe you think you want this, but but really you've got to listen to the Marxist intellectual because they really know what's good for you. They really know what your class consciousness is is. And so I think this this stands out continually as the as the problem for Marxism is that it and there are many problems, but here is, you know, this is a very significant one, but continually Marxism supposedly fights for the working class, but at the same time the working class isn't the one largely that supports these ideas and they by and large reject the ideas of the working class for internet intellectual elites. So you end up trading what you call the bourgeoisie for a new bourgeoisie, which is the Marxist intellectuals who control media and work in academic institutions and tell the uh, proletariat what's really good for them. All right. So uh, then I want to uh, finish here uh, quickly with Lukács' impact on critical theory, because we're going to move from this into critical theory as we look at Adorno. Uh, And Adorno is not the only figure in terms of critical theory in the Frankfurt School, but I don't want to, we're not going to do a separate hour on each of those figures. So he's just kind of the one I've picked. Um, But we could talk about uh, Horkheimer, who often writes with Adorno, Marcuse, and others too, that that are also all very, very significant. But Adorno is the one we'll be looking at. So Lukács is a really significant figure for critical theory. And as I said, he's kind of the bridge here between Marx, it's Marx, Lukács, then we have the development of critical theory. So here are five points. uh, And this is from a book. This is David Held's book, Introduction to Critical Theory, Horkheimer to Habermas. And this is in the the introductory section where he deals with Lukács. uh, If you want a text on critical theory, uh, this is a the the best that I've found. And I've read a number of books on critical theory, and a lot of them are written very poorly. Uh, the you know I read like the the Oxford Oxford uh, very short introduction series. I usually love those are like usually they pick really good scholars in in those fields usually to write the introductory volumes, and they're generally very helpful. Uh, I, I think the critical theory one was by far the worst one I've read, and I've read a lot of them. It was awful. Uh, and, and I don't know that I really understood much more about critical theory coming out of that than I did when I read the book. But so if you want an introduction, this is by far the best that you can read. Okay, so he summarizes Lukács' influence on critical theory in this way. So it's not just critics that are making this connection, by the way. This, this is made by those who are scholars of critical theory, not and not critics necessarily. Okay, so point one, the interplay between history and theory. So we talk about theory and the importance of theory being brought down into real history and the history that we or the the intellectuals here, but all people are really involved in. So it doesn't stay in this realm of theory, but it enters into real history here and now. Uh, second, theory helps develop the consciousness of the masses so that it is part of the role of theory to get the proletariat to understand their problem, to get them to get it so that they can revolt, essentially. Um, The third, the relationship between production and culture. And we'll see this especially in Adorno. Um, But there is a relationship between mass production and then culture. So culture starts to enter into the discussions pretty significantly, which is why people start using the phrase cultural Marxism to refer to a lot of these movements. And I've talked about this before. 
you know, I know cultural Marxism now is seen as just a conspiracy theory, but but it's very clear that Marxists do start saying culture is really the kind of the hinge here uh, in, in terms of awakening class consciousness. And they do this through Lukács, uh, Adorno, and then uh, critical theory as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the notion of reification that we've already talked about quite a bit, that becomes very influential for nearly all Marxist thinkers after Lukács. And then fifth, the possibility of unraveling society as a whole within each society, that is the totality. So each society within itself has the conditions whereby it can unravel itself or can overthrow the currently existing structures and uh, retake society in one way or another. All right, well, uh, that is my overview of Lukács. Hopefully you found this helpful. I know it's there's a lot to it. Uh, anytime we're doing an hour on a thinker like this, there, there's a lot of nuance that you can't quite get into, but I'm trying to do the best I can in this amount of time. Uh, let me know if you liked this, and if you want to see more, make sure you do subscribe, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. God bless.